I got some pens up here. Some of you guys are going to want to take some notes this morning. I'm going to be talking really fast, and you're not going to have time to write down or to open up all the scriptures. So in case you're ready to take notes, this is the answer to all the questions and the power that you've been wanting to know. How do we get through all this stuff? So today, what is your conquering power? The Word of God. Which is Jesus, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> we'll get to that. First, I want to deal with some information. I promise I'll end exactly at 8.14. So, um, yeah, here we go. With God's help, amen. So, a little bit of information to give you some background to substantiate what I'm going to say here in a minute. Uh, scripture has three words in the Greek language for the word word or the idea of words. One, the first one of those that we want to deal with, the first word is graphos. The Greek word graphos is translated scriptures. It's the literal paper and ink that you hold here in your lap. That's, that's what, it's nothing more than the physical thing itself. Okay? But there, there are some interesting things here. Sometimes I used to think that you couldn't separate the idea of the scriptures and the word of God, but you can. And it's really important to do that. John 5.39 up there is, Jesus talking to the Pharisees says, you search the scriptures and you think that in them you have life, but it's them that are talking about me. And then in 2 Timothy 3.15, it said, Paul talking to Timothy right before the famous verse where all scripture is God-breathed and inspired, right? And is, and is profitable for correction, reproof, rebuke, and, correct, and equipping for training for men and righteousness. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Those words are all in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> right before that, it says that the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. It's a really important point here. The scriptures don't save you. They make you wise for salvation. Okay? It's the word of God that saves you. There's a difference. The next word, logos is the next Greek word. Why are we using Greek words? Because in English we don't have other words to differentiate, so this will stick in your mind better. So, the next Greek word, word is logos. John chapter 1 establishes the idea of this, and that is, it's the eternal word. It's the unchangeable truth. It's that thing that's eternal in the heavens and cannot change. This is the physical representation of the word of God, inasmuch as... Jesus was the physical representation of the Father. Okay? So that's why this book itself is so important. But don't, you know, don't forget that Jesus' body was not that significant to him. Right? He laid down that. He didn't want you to make an image of it. His body wasn't significant. It was who he was on earth. So the Word of God, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. And the Word became flesh, verse 14. So the Word, the Logos, the eternal Word of God, became flesh. It's established in the heavens. It became scriptures. And then, Hebrews chapter 4 is a really interesting verse. Verse 12 is, we all know it, for the word of God is as a double-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder between soul and spirit, between bone and marrow, making known the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's logos. The logos is living and powerful. Okay, the same one that was the eternal word. The logos is living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder. Now, how does the logos do that? You get the next Greek word, rhema. Now, to, I want to I wanna deal momentarily with the, with the Pentecostal idea of the word rhema, because someone in Fullerton came up and asked me afterward on Wednesday. So, this is not some new revelation. Rhema is not that. It cannot be translated that way. It is simply a spoken word. The, 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 rhema, the Greek word rhema can only be translated as a spoken word, but it is that. It's an active word. It's a word from the page or from eternity that's put into action by the mouth. 
That's the only way, and that is the way, that the eternal word of God becomes active into your life. The Holy Spirit speaks his word into you, and then it becomes active. Now, what's important about this? Because this word is the one that we want to deal with today. We have all grown up with the understanding of the scriptures and the logos, the eternal word, the established word. But many of us have not put the word into action in our lives. We have not activated things. Just like Bill gave us a blessing. When you bless someone, your words have effect. And part of the the beginning of the message after this will be to show you if our words have an effect, how much more do the words of God have an effect? Our words, your very simple words, not the words of God, have, have effect on people based on your authority and your location in life. So, Rhema. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Famous verse that many of you know, but you never realize what the basis of it was. Jesus said what? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema of God. You don't necessarily live by every scripture, every graphos of God. You don't necessarily live by every logos of God. It's when the logos and the graphos become rhema. It doesn't do anything for you until you activate it in your life. This book on the floor does nothing for you. Make sense? Next one, Romans 10, 17. You all know it. How does faith come? By hearing. How does hearing come? Only when someone speaks to you. Right? You can't hear unless someone's speaking. So hearing comes by the word of God, the rhema of God. You can't hear. John 5 confirms this, that, that the voice of God, the Son of God will speak, and whoever hears his voice will hear and live. That's actually talking about voice. That isn't the words rhema, logos, or grapha. It's actually voice in that case. Whoever hears the voice of the Son of God will hear and live. So, first, are your words powerful? Do your words have an effect? There's a reason why. You, you might use that phrase, well, I, I didn't mean what I said. Well, that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, that says, you will be judged for every idle word that comes out of your mouth. Careful. That's what an idle word is. Okay? So that's the first warning in your words. The rest of this is to establish you to give you equipment. But you always need a warning when you grab a sword. It's sharp. Okay? That's what Proverbs says. It'll go down to the inmost parts of your soul. Just simple words. Now, rhema is the effective word. But then the effectiveness is based on the person that delivers that word. Okay? So... We have some situations in Scripture here, and I'll use the Scriptures to identify the points. Genesis chapter 27 is when Isaac is blessing Jacob. But you remember the situation. Jacob steals Esau's blessing, theoretically. Esau comes weeping to to Isaac, and he says, Don't you have a blessing for me? He says, No, truly, I have blessed him, and he will be blessed. In fact, in verse 37 there of the chapter, in chapter 27 of Genesis, it says, he says that he will be established with new wine and with grain. So the words of Isaac would give grain and wine to his son. That's how powerful words are. Actually, it's his words. It's not his hands giving it to him. The the blessing of of Jacob came because Isaac blessed him. And that's why I said this morning in our prayer time, go and bless somebody. Your words have power. God has given you authority. Now let's go to the next one. Genesis chapter 35 is when Jacob is in a situation. His wife is dying because she's giving birth to Benjamin. But first, what does she call him? She calls him Ben-Oni, son of my grief. But he says, no, that will not be the child's name. See, he, because he's the authority of the house, has the power to change her words, to change the situation, to change the household. 
And he says, no, he will not be Ben Oni. He'll be Ben Yamin, son of my right hand. He will be my precious son. He will not be son of my grief. And he changed the situation in his house by his words, but he had to be aware of what was going on. We're not going to live with that. Otherwise, the child will have a lot to overcome. Genesis chapter 49, verse 5. Simeon, Simeon and Levi are receiving their blessing from Jacob. And there, Simeon, actually, you find out, it says that he'll be scattered. Simeon and Levi will be scattered in the land. You go and read through Joshua and when the kingdoms divide. Simeon is the one that hardly ever had any place to settle. They never really settled. They were given an inheritance, but they never really settled anywhere. Now, Simeon was different from Levi. Levi was blessed because later on at the Mount Sinai, Levi honored God. And they're the ones that stood up and, and separated themselves from the rest of the tribe when Moses ground the calf into powder and all that. So Levi was blessed. Levi essentially took the curse and turned it into a blessing by God's acknowledging them for what they had done. So, it's true, Levi never got an inheritance. They never really established themselves in the land, but the Lord said, I will be their inheritance. So, the words, God honored the words of Jacob and at the same time brought it into a major blessing. He honors the words of his servants. Are you his servant? He will honor your words. Joshua chapter 26. They conquer Jericho. Jericho, or Joshua there at Jericho says, whoever rebuilds Jericho will do so at the cost of two sons, his first and his youngest. 1 Kings 16, you find out the man who rebuilt Jericho did so at the cost of his two sons. Why was that? Because of the words of Joshua. That was hundreds of years separated. Do words have that much power? Yes, they do. When you speak a word, it goes out into the wireless universe, and it is established in as much, not, well, not in as much, but similarly to the way that when you post a post on Facebook, it goes into a wireless world, and that affects people. You post something on Twitter, and that affects people, businesses. Donald Trump or somebody got in big trouble because of their Twitter post. People are telling him to apologize because he sent something into a wireless area. Did it have an effect on people? And you realize our words have an effect. How much more so when they are the words of God? Another one that I mentioned on, on Wednesday that I don't have in my notes is the situation with Rachel actually dying when she was giving birth to Benjamin. Do you remember what happened when she left Laban's house? She sat on the household gods. And what did Jacob say? Cursed be the person who took them, and may they die. Who was sitting on them and who died? He had no idea. But yet, be careful. To not, this is, you know, there's that phrase, and I don't remember where it's from exactly, but that, that, that idea of, presumptuous sins or presumptuous words even you know we, we we say things presuming an idea but we need to be careful with what we say not only on the bad side but also on the good side be careful that what does it say in, in uh, I believe it's Ephesians chapter 4 it says let every word give grace to those who hear give grace with your words be a blessing. Speak life, as Joseph would say. Speak life, because your words will have life. Proverbs chapter 10. I'm going to give you a few of them here. Proverbs 10, 19. Proverbs 12, 14. Proverbs 12, 18. Proverbs 13, 3. Proverbs 17, 27. And 29, 19. I'm just going to read a couple of them. Proverbs 12, 14 says... A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. And the recompense of a man's hands 
shall be rendered unto him. Verse 18 of the same chapter, there's someone that speaks like this. Uh, I don't like that translation. Let me switch it real fast. Uh, King James bothers me sometimes. I can't understand it. Speaking, speaking recklessly is like the thrusts of a sword, but the words of the wise bring healing. Speaking recklessly like Jacob did in that case. He was speaking very recklessly. He was so prideful that he hadn't done anything. And he just said, may the person die. Careful. Now, interestingly, when Joseph's brothers came out of Egypt, they said something similar. May the person die, whoever stole anything, and then they found the cup. Of course, Benjamin hadn't actually stolen it, but there was an authority difference in that case as well. They weren't his father. They were his brother. So there's a difference in your, who you have authority over in God's, in the eternal realm, matters with what you say. So that is another thing to be aware of. So Proverbs 13, 3, the one who guards his words guards his life, but whoever is talkative will come to ruin. So now just a quick uh, help for you, those of you that might be sitting there feeling like you've messed up and you don't know what to do. Proverbs 6 verse 2 says, If you have been ensnared by the words that you have spoken and have been caught by the words you have uttered, then, my child, do this. In order to deliver yourself because you have fallen into your neighbor's power, go humble yourself and appeal firmly to your neighbor. Permit no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the snare. Do it quickly. If you realize that you've done something, go and repent. The gift of repentance, remember? You have a gift. It's called repentance. If you do it, you may be able to change what you have spoken. So realize there is always mercy. Will the words work? Yes. Isaiah 55, 11. If your words will have an effect... They're not always perfectly effectual. But if your words will have an effect on people, how much more will God's words have an effect on people? Isaiah 55, 11 is the verse that you all know. His word, when it's spoken, will what? Not return void. And here's the other half of the verse. Sometimes the pastor never quoted, so he never remembered. It says, And it will accomplish the purpose of, for which it was sent. That's an important detail to the situation. What was the purpose sent of that word being sent out? Like some of the ones we'll get to. Every matter will be established by two or three witnesses. So, as you're getting ready to proclaim the word of God, always have two or three scriptures for every situation that you come across. Because Satan will come to you and tell you that's not true. That's just some idea from your mind. No. I've got another one. And I've got another one if you need it. I've told some people this. I don't know where I've told it. How well do you know your sword? How well can you swing it? Not just look at it. Not how can you tell the details of how it's composed and what it's made of? That's great. Can you swing it? Because until you can, it doesn't matter what it's composed of. It won't help you. It'll only help you when you get into a battle with another guy with another strong sword and you have to hit swords and make sure your composition is better than his. That's when it'll help you. But until you can swing it, it won't help you. So, do you know your sword? This is some purpose. Maybe up in the prayer room, we can, in our, all of our prayer rooms, we can start posting scriptures that we use in different scenarios. Now I have some. Um, oh, sorry. The last point there that I don't have on my notes that I put on there randomly because the Lord told me to as I was writing that. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. I went over this, I think, a couple weeks ago. One of the purposes of the church is actually to proclaim the word of God into the heavens. You can go and stand on the side of a mountain and proclaim the word of God and it will do something. Maybe you won't ever see it, but it will have an effect. 
Because it says there that we are to make known to the powers and authorities and principalities in the heavenlies what is the manifold wisdom of God. You need to tell Satan what God has done and tell him why he's defeated. That's one of our jobs. And show him you're done here at the cross. And so I have some categories of proclamations that we make. And this morning I was doing battle in our neighborhood. Our home is an embassy. People can run to us. It's a refuge. And yesterday I was getting some pretty heavy attack from the enemy because of that. But this morning I was up and I was doing battle around the neighborhood. And proclaiming these scriptures. Because I'm tearing down the strongholds. And we will do it. I don't have to talk to anybody to do that. But I do it out loud. If you don't speak it, it's not working. It doesn't work in here. It'll work for you in here, but it won't work for anyone else in here. In your head. So, categories. General attack. Just start writing these down as fast as you can, because I'm only going to do one or two, because I want to be honest with my time here. Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 4 are some of my favorites. These are, these are statements that Nebuchadnezzar make, and if you just read through the book, you'll realize that every time Daniel and his friends succeeded, Nebuchadnezzar made, made a profound statement about God and who he realized that God was, is. And so there's nothing wrong with you proclaiming the same thing. And actually, that's why I do it, because I want the world out there, I want people to know, I want the enemy to know. And remember who my God is, and I know who he is. So let uh, praise be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He gives knowledge to the discerning and wisdom to the wise. For he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. This is our God, right? You're going to tear down the enemy. You're going to remind Satan what's going on. When, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled later in chapter 4, he said, I, I praise and exalt the king of heaven. So in our house, we say, we exalt the king. We exalt the most high, actually, is the first part. And I praise and glorify him who lives forever. His authority, his kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom. And his uh, reign, the different translations, I'm looking at a different translation than what I have in my mind here, uh, extends from generation to generation. And then my favorite is then verse 37, which I was mentioning upstairs as well, that says, we praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. For everything he does is right, and all of his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I love declaring that. Just tell that to people. It'll work. And these others are significant as well. Uh, what they're doing is they're declaring the greatness of God to defeat your enemy. That's what each of those are mentioning there. Uh, general life promises that you want to activate in your life. You want to Declare that you are, not just that this is true. You don't want to just study this and realize that's the truth. You want to say, universe, Satan, enemies, I'm standing on this and this is mine. This is true for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Psalm 91, the whole thing. Memorize it. For he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that. The whole chapter then is based on that idea. You know, the Lord is our refuge. We will not fear the terror of night, the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Who know how many pestilences are there in our nation? Who wants to be saved from those? Many may, a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not come near us. You want that for your life? It will not, and then the next verse says, it will not come near our home. This is what we want, right? We're protecting our house. And then it says, if 
you make the most high your dwelling place. The Lord who is our refuge. And so that whole chapter is based on the idea that you're dwelling in the secret place. And that's also the, the chapter that mentions that you will not, the angels will lift you up in their hands to not dash your foot against a stone. You're being protected. Chuck Smith's house has a, in the entryway, it says protected by angels. It quotes Psalm 91, you know. So I, that's, that's why I'm saying the same thing. I was, I was excited because I was memorizing this chapter at the time that I saw that in his house. So Psalm 1, let's go to the next category. Is it healing? Yeah. Uh, healing, Psalm 103, I'll mention, is the, the part that mentions healing is the third verse, but it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who, heal, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. Do you want that for your life? Do you believe the Bible? Is it the word of God? Is it the established word? Is it true? Proverbs there, the couple of them, the one you know really well, the half of it at least. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. But the second half you don't know, probably, is <laughs> some of you might. Uh, huh? That you'll be healed. How? Do not consider yourself to be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn from all evil. This will be health to your body and strengthening to your bones. Think about that. Proverbs 4, there's a great testimony of a man who quoted this verse three times a day, took it like medicine, and he was healed of a skin disease. He mentions the same thing. Turn your ear to my word, listen diligently, and this will be health to all your flesh. Literally in both terms, both sides there, the, the Hebrew word is medicine. So that's why he took it like medicine. It says, this will be medicine if you do this. Pay attention to the word of God. The word of God will heal you. The spoken word, I believe. The spoken word will heal you. Next category, sin. When you're doing this, guess what Satan's going to do? You're a sinner. You're not worthy. Oh, yeah? Micah. Go to the Old Testament. It's great when you get grace from the Old Testament. Because everyone wants it from the New Testament. Micah chapter 7, one of my favorite. I'll read it in a different translation just to throw myself off. There is no other God like you. You forgive sin and pardon the rebellion of those who re remain among your people. You do not remain angry forever, but delight in showing loyal love. You will once again have mercy on us. You will conquer our evil deeds. You will hurl our sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. You want to stand on that one for your sins? Declare it for yourself. First John, you know. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Romans, you know. You're not condemned if you stand in Christ Jesus and walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you're walking according to the flesh, I can't say anything for you. But if you're walking according to the Spirit, you cannot be condemned. And if you are walking according to the flesh, then repent, and you can't be condemned. It's that simple. It's just stand in the Word of God. You can be confident in this. Financial provision, some of you need. We quote these every day. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'll just deal with verse 8. It says that our God is able. He is able. Do you believe that? Our God is able to make all grace abound toward us so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now that's a pretty all-inclusive statement, isn't it? I don't think anything's left out of all. Philippians, many of you know. My God will supply all of your needs according to His riches. Thankfully, it's not yours. According to His riches, my God will supply your needs. No matter what I'm seeing in my own life, no matter what my bank account looks like, 
my God will supply your needs according to his riches and glory. I remember sharing that with a homeless guy. I said, if you keep coming to me, I'm going to run out. What good is that? So I give him a couple bucks, but my goal is to get him to realize you need to go to God. He will supply your needs. If you're not trusting him, why should I keep giving to you? Other than because the Bible tells me to. But I'm not going to be able to give you much. You're just going to be in misery your whole life. Some of these guys that proclaim to be Christians, I always ask them why they're asking for money from non-Christians. Is your God going to supply all your needs? I'll give them a buck and say, put it in your pocket, not in that, because I know where it's going and it's not for you. You know, go and Jesus told me to give to everyone who asks of me. So I'm giving to you, not to this organization thing. You know, and by the way, you don't have to give them 20 bucks every time. Just give them a quarter. You won't go broke. <laughs> right? Innocent as a dove, wise as a serpent. Right? It's smart. And then I always, sometimes I have to walk by them because I realize I don't have enough time to talk to them because I have to talk to them. And I have to make them realize you should not be asking money from non-believers. As a, if you're saying you're a Christian organization, you should not be asking money from non-believers. Or do you not trust your God? Because you seek first the kingdom of God and he will provide all these things. There's so many scriptures you can go to. These are just starters for you guys to, realize, to open your mind to realize you can use these for your life. It will make a difference. Start proclaiming it in faith. Don't be just belligerent. Oh, well, fine, I'll just read it. You know, uh, no, it, you know, don't expect anything if you doubt. Don't expect anything if you're doubting the whole time. But if you're believing and you're standing on this word of God that you know to be true by historical fact, we don't believe in a fairy tale. We believe and recognize history to be accurate. It is a historical fact that Jesus came to earth, defeated the kingdom of darkness, and rose from the grave. It's historical fact. So why are we doubting? Look at him who has spoken today in Hebrews and have a full assurance of faith. Not just... I hope so. No. You hope in what you know is coming. That's real hope. Have real faith. How many of you are in? You guys going to start getting the word down? Start using your sword? How many of you are going to go home and start practicing? Yeah? Amen. Well, lock hands with a brother and let's commit it to the Lord. God, we praise you and we thank you for your sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Train men this morning, train men this week with how to use it, I pray. Bless them, O Lord. Bless them, I pray. As your Word says in Numbers, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go get him.